Hi. Delivery for Michael Scott. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm so nervous. I can sign for it. Oh, thanks. Let's get your boss laid Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever you come into the office, I want you to think about this. Oh. Ah. We will be co-managers again. Thank you. Ah! Ah! No! God, please, no! No! Ah! Oh. Ah! I'm serious about this stuff. Bankruptcy! Stop yelling at me! No! It's not me! The Office came to life on March 24, 2005, a mockumentary about employees of a paper company, most of them middle-aged. If I tell the synopsis to someone who doesn't know The Office, they will probably have gotten bored of listening to me. And perhaps that is the irony of setting a sitcom in such a mundane place, of making The Ordinary the center of the comedy, and also the drama. Although The Office achieved its consolidation in popular culture, when it was initially released, the conditions for it to get ahead weren't in its favor. The mockumentary format was quite strange in the United States, and common people are not usually a very attractive target for the screen. Along the way, The Office proved its quality in practically every area of television production, managing to air for 9 years or a total of 201 episodes. But once finished, the series continued to accumulate audiences of all ages, and became even more viewed on streaming platforms than when it aired. In addition to an efficient and effective comedy, The Office is characterized by creating an ordinary reality, easy to relate and connect, which is part of the success of the series and its premise explicitly exposed in the last sentence of the final episode. To understand the legacy that The Office leaves us, and how it achieved its success in various generations, we will delve into why it is so easy to relate to this series, how its comedy works, we will also take a look at how it was produced, and go through its darkest days, to finally address its central message, beauty in ordinary things. Would I rather be feared or loved? Um, easy, both. I want people to be afraid of how much they love me. The comedy of The Office is a consequence of authenticity. Let's keep that in mind for this section. In the mundane context of a paper company, the series uses every event or every element of everyday life that gets a little out of the routine to exploit them to the fullest. For example, birthdays, celebrations, <laughs> meetings, That's just the way we talk in the clink. talks, Blood alone moves the wheels of history! Business trips, holidays, trainings, and pranks. Identity theft is not a joke, Jim. Millions of families suffer every year. But above all, the most used are uncomfortable situations. If you could sign my cast. Mm -hmm. Situations that do not go as they are supposed to are often perceived as awkward. In the ordinary, it is very easy to generate a situation like this, because many simple things can go wrong. I'm supposed to be meeting someone named Michael. Oh, that's not... yeah, I'm Michael? And it's even easier for these situations to occur with people with little self-awareness. Try my cookie cookie! Try my cookie cookie! Try my... There are many scenes that are difficult and even painful to watch. The realism of the mockumentary helps the awkwardness effectively invade the viewer, but the more times one watches these scenes, the easier and more enjoyable they become to watch. A great example is Dinner Party. That is a $200 plasma screen TV you just killed! 
Something similar happens with uncomfortable experiences that the viewer himself may have. At the moment it happens, it is an unpleasant situation, but after a while you can remember that moment and laugh at it, although it is still an awkward experience. Aside from this type of humor, another mainstay of the series' comedy is the reactions and responses of the characters. Let's remember again that the comedy in The Office is a consequence of authenticity, and authenticity is something that shines through in the characters. Take Michael for example. We hear him speak quite confidently, even when what he's saying is wrong or inappropriate. Okay, okay, you know what? This is disgusting. This is like a witch hunt. This is like the Blair Witch Hunt project. I'm not superstitious, but... I'm... I am a little stitious. It's funny because he honestly believes what he says, as does Dwight. A big part of Dwight's comedy is that he takes everything he does and hears quite seriously. And like Michael, he's not aware enough to realize that what he's doing is ridiculous. On the other hand, Jim is one of the characters with the greatest awareness of himself, of others, of the present situation, and that a documentary is being recorded. As a result, many of his reactions are directed towards the camera, and many of his responses are teasing those who show ineptitude. Nice. I can't understand I, you! I, my, the triangle. Authenticity and comedy are united elements in all characters. He has no wallet, I checked. How would you feel if Michael was sleeping with your mom? The mother's in a wheelchair. There are few occasions when we see characters tell jokes, and even when they do, the real humor is in their reactions. Take for example this cold open from the Golden Ticket episode. Here are three jokes. Michael's, Dwight's, and Jim's. None of these jokes are meant to be particularly funny. The humor is in Michael's desperation to tell his joke, in his anger at Dwight, in Dwight's reaction after Jim slaps him, and in the resulting enjoyment of Michael and Jim. The definition of the characters allows to verify that the comedy is organic, there are responses and reactions that only belong to a specific character, and that if another character said or had them, it would be easily noticed. Your department's just you, right? Yes, Jim, but I am not easy to manage. I got six numbers. One more would have been a complete telephone number. Thanks to the fact that they have been defined both in personality and in dynamics with other characters, many of the most acclaimed moments are those scenes where several or most of the cast participate, such as the scene of RCP training, dinner party, secret Santa, PowerPoint, and of course, fire drill. <laughs> The most responsible for the success and nature of The Office was Greg Daniels, who was in charge of adapting and developing the American version of the original British series of the same name. He previously worked as a screenwriter on The Simpsons and was a co-creator of King of the Hill. Greg Daniels made The Office production a true collective creation. Some of the stories in the episodes are based on real events that happened to the writers, such as this scene from Diversity Day, inspired by an anecdote from a writer's assistant. You wanna get high? No. I think you do, man. Stop. Okay. Or the idea of the Dundies, which was born based on an award event for the workers of King of the Hill, called the Swampies. The achievement of a collective creation is also part of the fact that several of the actors also served as writers, highlighting BJ Novak, Ryan started the fire! It was always Mindy Kaling, That little girl is a child. I don't wanna Michael Schur, Paul Liverstein. I have a daughter. How can I be a virgin? And even Steve Carell. Should I keep going? Why are you the way that you are? On The Office Ladies podcast, hosted by Jenna Fisher and Angela Kenzie, they tell more about the dynamic between actors, writers, and producers. Greg really trusted us to be the experts of our characters. So whenever he was trying to mull something over or justify something, he would come to us and ask us. He trusted us to have done our homework and know our characters so well that we could contribute. The performance of the cast of The Office is characterized especially by the deepness and definition of its characters and by the capacity for improvisation. Both things are related, since to improvise a reaction of a character you have to know it well first. As an anecdote, the casting process was partially based on improvisation, interviewing the actors while in character. When recording The Office, various improvised moments became many fan favorites. Technical aspects are not far behind, 
The documentary format and without laugh track is always an immersive element as it brings realism. And the fact that employees are aware of the presence of the cameras and that they can express themselves in front of them gives greater closeness with these characters. Since the office focuses more on the people, the element that is most cared for are the personalities of each one. We already know that the writing and acting are responsible for making these personalities consistent, but editing is also part of this work. The show has quite a few deleted scenes, not only because of the limited time of each episode of 22 minutes, but also because there were scenes where the characters did or said something that is not very consistent with their personality. I can handle it. You can all pile on after my smoke break. <laughs> no. It's called Untai, and it's art. The office had a lot of directors and writers, each with different experiences, but it was Greg Daniels, a showrunner, who set the tone and atmosphere of the series, so that the entire crew adapted to this nature. The end result was a synergy between everyone involved, an environment where everyone enjoyed doing the show. Pam, thank you! <laughs> Pam, why don't you work with Phallus and draw a picture of the composer? <laughs> 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 Another key to The Office's success was maintaining balance and dynamism. Although we can agree that Jim, Michael, Pam and Dwight are the main characters, the other characters do not feel secondary. In each episode everyone has their respective participation. I didn't realize that everybody here dresses up every year. Me neither. Besides, everyone has episodes where the plot focuses more on each of them, and generally speaking, the series simply wouldn't work out the same without them. After all, we are talking about an office with its various departments. The British version of The Office ran for two seasons of six episodes each, and a Christmas special. The American version ran for nine years, and maintaining dynamism throughout that time required employing a bit of drama in this comedy. Romance in The Office has been one of the engines of the series. It was used for dramatic purposes. I'm sorry I misinterpreted uh, our friendship. For comedic purposes. It, I'm sorry, no offense, but it's really sexy. Please don't smell me like and for character development. And I don't know why you downgraded what we had, but I did not make us up. The romantic lives of the main characters were like a roller coaster ride. Michael went through various ups and downs, short relationships that didn't end well until he finally met Holly, with whom he matured and eventually started a family. This is where I fell in love with you. Jim and Pam began with a discreet flirtation. Then Jim revealed what he felt. And although it resulted in things getting cold for a while, a long-awaited relationship ended up emerging that progressively grew stronger by becoming a family. In the last season, Greg Daniels saw fit to destabilize the relationship so that the ending was more satisfactory, by seeing that everything ended well for them. The office behaves perfectly like a classroom, which is why even people who have not been in a work environment can easily identify themselves. It is like a classroom with friendships, enmities, secrets, romances, and betrayals. All of these are phenomena that arise from daily coexistence, and for this reason, finishing the series arouses emotions in many, because it can feel like the last day of school, or college, or a job change. As Andy says, I wish there was a way to know you're in the good old days before you've actually left them. Many remember school days with affection and nostalgia, but there are also those who would have done different things, and have certain regrets such as, I wish I had talked to that person I liked. Sorry, what's up? Um, if, uh... <laughs> Is it me? I wish I had been braver. I kept wanting to scream at Pam. It took me so long to do so many important things. I wish I had done this or that, but that time is over. Almost all conflicts in the office are caused by very common defects. Poor communication. Is this the bottle timer? I didn't think you were going to get that one. Lack of self-knowledge. Of making me your husband. And moral deficiency. Angela, you have to put a stop to this right now. I will respect the results of the duel. No character is totally good or totally bad, neither white nor black but grey. They are multi-dimensional, and therefore they are more real. 
It's easier to relate to Jim, who makes mistakes like not being honest with his feelings, than it is to identify with someone who does everything well. It's easier to relate to Pam trying to pursue her dreams, than it is to identify with someone who had a quick path to artistic recognition. In a nutshell, it is easier to identify with real and ordinary people. And while the defects of the characters can frequently lead them to have problems with each other, at the end of the day, they must at least tolerate each other's existence, whether they get along well or badly, since in the office, as in the school, a kind of forest family is formed. Making a parallel with daily life, we must bear in mind that while we are studying or working, one will spend half of the day living with the same group of people, 8 hours of sleep that we are not aware of, 8 hours at work and 8 hours outside of work. It is a huge part of our time that we spend and we will spend with the same group. The physical space of the office becomes equally familiar. It is a place that you are already used to. You know where each one is sitting, just like in a classroom. You know where the entrance is, the break room, the annex, the bathrooms, the conference room or the kitchen. Each of these places have their own stories and events. All that has been said results in a pleasant feeling of comfort, since it is a place that the spectator recognizes and with which he knows that he's going to have fun, which motivates to watch the series over and over again. Even if you don't identify with the characters, that pleasant feeling of comfort is universal in everyone, which is why it doesn't matter if you're a common person or if you're a pop star like Billie Eilish. As follower of the series, one finds close people in these characters, and to watch any episode is to immerse yourself again in the reality of The Office. Before moving on to the premise or main message of The Office, it is necessary to talk about the decline of the last seasons. This is the point of greatest fragmentation among followers of the series. Generally speaking, The Office manages to sustain its premise of beauty in ordinary things, but in the last two seasons there was a detour, regardless of whether they were enjoyable or not. It can be argued that The Office already presented changes in seasons 5, 6 and 7 from previous ones, but it still maintain its essence and the quality of the scripts. The last episodes of season 7 served as a prediction to the change of tone and comedy. Angela? Sorry, I freaked you guys out. A, B, and so forth. The last two seasons executed the change. Sick of you and you. You are bleeding through your shirt. Oops. We went from seeing common situations with which one could relate, to seeing absurd situations that, although they can be funny, do not coincide with what The Office proposed. And this does not necessarily have to be the fault of the creative team, because it is inevitable to reach a point where the ordinary situations that some office workers might experience are exhausted. As a result, the humor became more absurd, and some characters became a cartoonish version of what they once were, something known as flanderization. The last two seasons are also the ones without Michael Scott, another reason for the series' decline, and we have to be careful with this. Michael Scott is not The Office, but he is a fundamental piece. He's one of the columns that supports the concept of the series and its dynamics, so his presence is necessary for it to work. You don't even know my real name. I'm the f Wizard Gang. Before The Office, James Spader already had an extensive acting career, almost entirely in movies and drama series, rarely in comedy. Perhaps this is why Robert California is an interesting character with his funny moments, but his presence does not fit the atmosphere of The Office. You're gonna wanna hear the sexual metaphor. Was that not the All life is sex. Although his character was never intended to replace Michael Scott, it is true that the production saw a movie and television star with the sole objective of maintaining the interest of the audience, rather than focusing more on who would be a better fit. After Steve Carell's departure was announced, most of the actors and producers still wanted to continue. Did you think the show could go forward when Steve left? I knew the show could go forward. I didn't know what the plan was. I couldn't see through the trees. But after being disappointed with the 8th season, they all finally decided that the series should end. It doesn't make much sense to point out the culprits, since many of the crew of the 8th and 9th seasons are the same ones who forged the series. A concept like The Office has potential for years, but is not eternal. 
Knowing when to end a series is not always easy. You can be part of the cast and be excited to continue, or be part of the television network and not want to give up the profits. There are quite a few more serious examples of shows that have not finished when they should. No one enables a descent into madness better than you. Can you go get Dr. Lewis? Now! In the case of The Office, we're talking about seven against two seasons, and we have to consider that in these last two, there were some acclaimed and memorable episodes. This is Jim. Hmm. What the? You've been meatballed. <laughs> Dwight Schrute is manager! And some moments that allude to the ordinary. Stanley doesn't have a mustache. We are splitting a sublet on a place near Philly. Just a couple of grown, sexy-ass roommates. Yeah! All right. <laughs> In the end, the series had a closure that did it justice. For these reasons, it wouldn't be fair to dismiss any message or value that The Office has tried to convey. And that is what we will see next. Every day when I came into work, all I wanted to do was leave. So why in the world does it feel so hard to leave right now? Many of the characters weren't planning on staying long at Dunder Mifflin. The very idea of spending so much time of their lives in a paper company was totally depressing. I don't think it would be the worst thing if they let me go. I just, I don't think it's many little girls dream to be a receptionist. Well, if this were my career, I'd have to throw myself in front of a train. How is it that we went from a Jim who prefers to die instead of continuing with this job to a Jim who only wants everything to stay as it is? As the office progresses, the colors become more vivid. There is less silence. The environment becomes warmer. The first season feels like a cold Monday morning, with stiffness and certain distances between the characters, while in the last seasons the dynamics and relationships are more than established, and the energy is almost palpable. However, the work itself remains the same. They continue to do the same thing and in the same space. In the end, the real important thing was the people. He's probably the only person you're not gonna like. Kindle. Ugh. So... Jim turned down a better job because Pam meant more. Just as Michael left the company to which he dedicated almost 20 years of his life to start his own family. Perhaps the greatest proof that the work takes a back seat is that the series only does comedy with the interactions between the characters and omits the time in which they are actually working. Human beings have this miraculous gift to make that place home. Many people have worked and are working on something that they don't like, but that doesn't stop them from making friends or meeting future partners in that job, which leaves us with the idea of being active in the present moment. Beauty in ordinary things is a vindication of ordinary people, the idea that normal people matter. In a society constantly in search of fame and money, The Office exposes ordinary things as things that are also great, like a celebration of the mundane. This series has a cultural element inherent to the ideals of the United States, the American dream. Everyone knows its character of economic prosperity, but little is said about its social dimension, the concept of integration and even the classic pursuit of happiness. At the end of the day, no matter how much money one has made, it is difficult to affirm that someone has fulfilled as a person while being marginalized from the rest. The American dream is not just, I'm gonna get the biggest house. It's not just, I'm gonna get the best car. It's not just, I'm gonna marry the most beautiful person, the most handsome person. The American dream is you find a place where you belong and where you feel like you have people who care about you, who want the best for you, and the office tapped into it. There's a lot of beauty in ordinary things. You just gotta stop and look for it. And that's all for today. If you liked it, don't forget to subscribe and share this content to support it. Below in the description are the links to my social media in case you want to follow me elsewhere. And as always, thank you very much for watching.